Hi everyone, my name is Chelsea. Welcome to Little Mountain Ranch. I am happy to have you here with me today. We are wandering down to the garden to do a couple tasks that I really need to take care of. But on our way, we're just gonna check it out because it's beautiful and it is a beautiful time of year in the garden. Echinacea, getting close. Borage, looking beautiful. Roses, gonna have some elderberry soon. Some more beautiful echinacea and a stray catnip. Where did you come from? Most of the cherries are all picked from the cherry tree. Oh, look! The wild bergamot, otherwise known as bee balm, is starting to bloom. The bees are gonna be happy about that. It is so beautiful out right now. It rained a good two inches last night and the garden has just kind of exploded this morning. Got a lot of the raspberries all picked yesterday but we are having some more starting to get ready to pick. Such a great year for raspberries this year. Oh my gosh, it's so beautiful. Oh, look at the poppies coming up in the carrot patch down there. I'm so glad I planted them in there. I am a firm believer in planting flowers in your vegetable garden in amongst your vegetables. Number one, it just takes my breath away because flowers are so beautiful. It attracts pollinators and it encourages me to be down in my garden and doing the work that the garden requires while being able to enjoy some beauty. Look at these. Oh my gosh, look at how beautiful that poppy is. This was a rainbow mix of poppy. I have some weeds in there that I planted in amongst my carrot plants and look at that. Isn't that stunning? Uh, this is a poppy mix that I got from West Coast Seeds here. They are all different. How stunning. Oh, there's pale yellow ones over here. Oh, I love them. And how beautiful is that? I just saw a gigantic cauliflower down here. Let's get this one picked. See if there's anything else here. Nope, looks good. Let's pull up a carrot and see how they're looking. Wow, look at that. Just look at that carrot. These are bolero carrots and they're beautiful. These were those pelleted seeds that I was talking about, also from West Coast Seeds, and I will definitely be planting these again. I have my leeks right here and this is my first time growing leeks and from what I have heard I want to wait until this is around an inch and a half across. It's getting close before I harvest and ooh, there's a couple of really big ones there. That one looks very close to being ready. So my plan is I'm going to cut all these up and freeze dry them. The ones that I don't use fresh anyway, so that I will have them for winter. The straw flowers up here have really started blooming. So I have been picking them when they open up during the day and starting to hang them to dry for the winter. Wow, these are definitely needing to be harvested. So I think we'll just do a quick harvest on these guys right now. This is chamomile, and I'm gonna freeze dry that for tea for the winter. For those of you that are new to our channel, we are in the central interior of British Columbia, Canada, and we are in a zone 3B. So zones refer to how cold it gets in the winter time. And the reason why a zone is important is because perennials uh, cannot handle, some perennials can't handle really cold extended fr freezing temperatures in the winter time. So for instance, we can't grow peaches up here or sweet cherries up here because it is just far too cold in the winter time. The more important factor for me is our frost dates and how short of a growing, growing season we have. So for the last couple years, we've been getting frost into June and we usually get a light frost by the end of August and a frost that's going to kill anything like squash or anything that's really um, tender by mid-September. So it is a fairly short, intensive growing season. One of the benefits to our growing 
climate is the fact that because it is so harsh in the winter time, we don't have a lot of issues with bugs in our garden. The biggest thing that we deal with is the cabbage moth. So even though in some ways it is challenging to grow here, I think sometimes it's more challenging to grow in warmer climates. So anything that's a root vegetable grows incredibly well here. All the brassicas, like the coal crops, they all grow really well here. Cabbages, broccoli, cauliflower. We can't grow things like tomatoes and peppers outside very well. I've tried it for a couple of years, but they don't usually ripen and they don't grow very large. And normally I end up having to ripen most of them indoors. So I stopped doing that a few years ago and bought a high tunnel. And that has definitely transformed my gardening uh, abilities up here in the north. And that's where we're gonna be heading to next because I do have some work that I need to do. This chamomile smells so good. This is just one plant right here. So you see how I'm doing this, is I'm just putting my fingers in and kind of raking upwards to pull the flowers off. And that tends to work really well. So let's check out our zucchinis. We have to keep a really close eye on them because they grow so fast. Okay, this is very exciting. You guys get to be here for some firsts in the garden this year. We have zucchini, look at that beauty. Oh my gosh, that is a gorgeous zucchini. We are going to have tons of them. Look at all the zucchinis in there. Oh, there's another one. What about in here? Ooh, these ones, I'm gonna pick this size because I'm gonna fry these up with some butter and some garlic for lunch. But for things like zucchini relish, which I'm going to be making a ton of, I'll wait till they get a little bit bigger. That is so exciting. Okay, pickling cucumbers. Not quite yet. These are super slow this year. Oh, there's one. We have another heat wave that's supposed to be coming through. So that should hopefully kick these into high gear. Some cute little mushrooms in there. Oops. This is the reason why you need to come and check every day, even if they're not coming on strong, because once they hit this size, they're a little bit too big for making pickles. Oh, there's another one. Some beautiful squash plants in here. Oh, look, these ones are spaghetti squash. We might actually get some spaghetti squash this year after all. That's exciting. Oh, there's more. Spaghetti squash do really well in our growing climate. Look at these green acre cabbages. They are just looking gorgeous this year. Brussels sprouts doing their thing. I have a bunch of broccoli over here that I need to pick. These are all side shoots here, but you can see this one's gonna start flowering. So I need to get all of these picked. But I think what I might do is pick the majority of these on my way back up from the high tunnel so these don't sit down in the high tunnel where it's hot while I'm working. You saw how big my broccoli heads were on some of my other broccoli. Look at how little this one is, just a little tiny one. And all of the broccoli that are in this area are all super tiny like that. And the reason for that is that I was away when it was time to plant these out in the garden. So they sat in the greenhouse for way longer than they were supposed to. And they were in really rough shape when we brought them out to the garden. And whenever a broccoli or a cauliflower plant are stressed, they will send up a smaller head like that. The stress signals to the plant to just get some flower up there and some seed happening um, as soon as possible because for some reason in the environment, they're not gonna have a great chance of propagating itself and making seed. So basically it's like, I'd rather get something up than nothing at all. And that's why I have all these little tiny heads here. Tiny heads are better than none though. 
The same thing is happening with the cauliflower that got planted out in the same manner. Look at these little tiny baby heads here. I wasn't actually gonna plant all these out because I knew that was gonna happen, but I decided that I would rather get some than none at all off those plants. I think when we go inside, we're gonna pick ourselves a bouquet from the garden as well. Look at all these gorgeous zinnia, aren't those beautiful? And the advantage to actually getting these cut off here is it will signal to the plant to start branching out from the bottom a little bit more. So we'll pick some of those, maybe some of these guys. I love this little bed right here. So pretty with the sunflower, some beautiful calendula coming on here, some more gorgeous squash and sunflowers and corn. And I have a couple more zucchini plants up here. So let's check them out. Oh, there's another one. What about here? This one is called Black Beauty. Not quite ready yet, just about though. Okay, let's head down to the high tunnel and get it opened up so that we can get some work done in there. It's around 84 degrees, 28 or so in here, which honestly isn't that bad, but it will feel very hot after an hour or two of working. So we're gonna open up our doors. I have doors like this on the front and the back. My back door is open. Grab my yarn and we'll go roll up the sides and then we're gonna get to doing some serious trellising. If you were with me in my last video, then you saw this, but if not, let me show you what we're dealing with. This is a pathway. Do you see a pathway there? I don't see a pathway there, so we are going to go tie up all these tomato plants so that we can actually get through here and see what we have going on. And even this one is starting to close in a little bit and I've been doing a relatively decent job maintaining this one and, and this one too, but we're going to focus most of our attention today on the far pathway, way down there and work our way up this way. I have my apron on with my scissors and my yarn in it. So I don't have to keep going back and forth to my table. So I'm just going to get a bunch of this yarn cut so that I have a whole bunch and I can just whip my way down this row as quickly as possible. I'm not gonna get too carried away with pruning. I'm just gonna try to get everything tied up and then I'll go back afterwards and <clears throat> cut off a whole bunch of this so that I can actually see what I'm working with here. One of the issues with having a lot of foliage is that you'll miss tomatoes and they will end up getting overripe or splitting outside of just disease control. Um, keeping your plants pruned back just so that you can actually see what's happening is not a bad idea. Okay, there, we've got a whole bunch of those cut. We'll bring our scissors with us anyway. And we will, I think we're mostly dealing with the tomatoes along the side here that are falling over. So I'm actually gonna need longer strings for the ones on this side because I don't have a cattle panel. As you can see here, these ones are along a cattle panel and these ones are actually just tied up to the post here. Most of the tomatoes on this side are bush tomatoes, which usually just need a little bit of support, but not a ton of trellising. Whereas the tomatoes on this side are, um, indeterminate, which means they're just going to keep growing and growing and growing. They're very viney and um, they definitely need a lot of support. So I have decided to uh, top my tomato plant. So remember the last time we were in the high tunnel together talking about this, I said that I was considering topping them. So the idea behind topping tomato plants is that um, because we're heading towards the time where any flowers that are gonna be forming are not gonna have time to actually mature into fruit, that if you top your tomato plant, it'll start putting all of the energy into the fruit production on the plant below where you top it. And what I was thinking about when I was contemplating doing this, and I shared this um, with you guys last time we were in the high tunnel, 
is that because pruning generally encourages the plant to start forming a bushier plant below, so it's gonna send out side shoots and more leaves and stuff below the part where you prune. That's why a lot of people prune like fruit trees and things like that, that's the whole idea behind it. So my thought was, well, doesn't it kind of defeat the purpose if the plant is just gonna go try to put in a whole bunch of energy into growing more foliage and not actually into that fruit uh, production. But in doing some reading on it and talking to a couple of you in the comment section about it, I have decided that I am going to do it. But what I am going to do is if I notice that there's a bunch of branching that's happening below is I'm just gonna snap those off as they come up. Um, our season was started out fairly cold this year. So the plants didn't have a ton of opportunity to develop early on in the season. So I do wanna give them as much of a chance as possible. I am happy to see quite a few tomatoes on here. Check this out. Tomatoes, 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 tomatoes. Tomatoes even up high on the tomato plant. Lots more down there. So that's very encouraging. So to decide where exactly I am going to top these. As you can see, some of these plants, oh, you can't even see the top of it, are extremely tall, um, like well over seven feet tall. So I think I'm gonna cut them off where this one is, has some fruit actually forming here. So I think I'm actually gonna take it down right above this clump of developing fruit. And I'm gonna do the same thing all the way along. Hmm. It's hard to take flowers off though. Uh, especially if we end up having a really long, um, hot summer. There might, might be a chance that some of these might be able to develop. So I won't take all of the flowers off, but I will cut them off here. I'll show you a little bit closer so you can see what I'm doing flowers here with some tomatoes so I'm cutting just above that. I can already move a little more freely in here so I've done this little section so now I'm going to turn around and work on this over here and because these are bush style tomatoes on this side I am just going to take off the suckers but I'm not going to top these. <sighs> yeah there is just no point in having all this foliage in here because I can't even see what I am dealing with. Good gracious. I think I might have put some indeterminants in here by accident because there is definitely some seriously viney growth happening here. I am happy. You know, if we were to have an extra month of warm weather this year, this could potentially be my best tomato harvest ever <laughs> because there are a lot of flowers on here. And if each formed a tomato, it would be a bumper crop because I just think it's gonna be a more efficient way to do it. And then a little bit later on, I'll come along and do the bush tomatoes on this side. I think I am also going to start a couple of batches of sauerkraut because I have some cabbages that are ready. So we'll do that when we head back up to the house. Okay, I have made a significant dent gotten to about right there i still have many hours of work left to do on here but that is all i'm going to do for today now i'm going to head up to the garden grab a couple of cabbages and make up some sauerkraut i'll grab a couple carrots too i like my sauerkraut with garlic and carrots in it so good i need to get into the habit of bringing my wagon down with me again because this time of year, there's so much coming out of the garden and every time I come down, I more than fill my little uh, apron here. So let's look at our cabbages. Oh dear, yes, good thing that I am here because all that rain we got last night split this cabbage. So let's grab a couple of them. These are beautiful cabbages. So this is a cabbage that I harvested, I don't know, probably three weeks ago. 
And as you can see, there's little tiny baby cabbages forming off of where I cut the cabbage. So just like with uh, broccoli, you can actually just cut your main head off and leave the bottom stalk. These ones are good for stir fries because they're pretty tiny, but why not get a second harvest? Got our cabbages and I'm bringing this split one up because if I leave it, this just split last night with all of that rain. So I feel totally comfortable using this for sauerkraut. I wouldn't if it had been in the garden for a couple of days because there's lots of opportunity for kind of gross things to get up inside of that. You can still wash it up, but I wouldn't use it for sauerkraut. Okay, I think three will do us for today. Oh my goodness. Wow, the harvest is really starting to come out of the garden now. We have some more cauliflower getting close to being ready. So I'm just covering them up so the sun doesn't hit them and turn them yellow. Holy moly, look at that. Look at the size of that. That is stunning. So I guess we are harvesting cauliflower tomorrow because there are a ton of them to uh, come out of the garden. What a gorgeous day out. It's nice and warm, but the sun is going behind the clouds and it uh, feels lovely with that cool breeze. All right, my friends, we are on to day two of this video and we are also on to take two of this part of this video. I forgot to turn my microphone on when I went outside. Oh, I hate it when I do that. I have not done that in a very long time. Anyway, that is why I am all hot and sweaty right now because we were just out in the garden together, except that you weren't with me, <laughs> doing a whole bunch of harvesting. We harvested a ton of cauliflower. I'll show you some of the gorgeous heads in the wagon outside. We also harvested a whole bunch of broccoli and I'm going to make a bodacious broccoli salad for our lunch today. And I'm gonna show you how to do that. And we started all of the prep work for our sauerkraut. So I'm gonna walk you through all of the steps that we took to get to this point of the sauerkraut. It is almost ready right now, as you can see by all the liquid dripping out of there to get into the jars. But I do want to add some grated carrot, which we also just picked out in the garden, and a little bit of garlic to my sauerkraut. Making sauerkraut could not be easier. So I used two and a half cabbages here, and you can see the size of metal bowl I have. That does about a gallon of sauerkraut. I'm taking out the stem part, and then I am quartering it and slicing it into long, thin strips, which is my preferred size for sauerkraut. You can adjust it according to your taste preferences. Then all you need is two tablespoons or so of sea salt, or in this case, I'm using kosher salt. Put that in there and give it a good knead. I usually knead it for around 10 minutes or so until it's nice and soft and all of the liquid is coming out of it. And I'll show you the next steps in just a minute. So what we're going to do right now, because it is lunchtime and we are hungry, is we're going to get our salad. All I'm doing right now is chopping up the broccoli into fairly small size florets. And I have some bacon over here that is just thawing enough for me to cut it up. I did not uh, cut all of my, or slice all of my bacon this year, just because I was really busy when I was making my bacon. So I have to do that now. And we are going to also add some red onion, which I also just grabbed out in the garden. This is a very simple, but very delicious salad and everybody loves it. So you just, I'll make sure that I put a link to the recipe that I am using. I've been using the same recipe for years for this salad, but there's lots of different broccoli type salads. I just, this bodacious broccoli recipe, I personally find to be the best that I've tried. And I did add some of the stalks in there as well. So it got a nice crunch. So there we go. Now we're going to push all this mess off of here, sort of clean off our cutting board and grab our bacon. So this is a maple bacon that I made. I'm just gonna cut this extra chunk of fat off here that I did, I don't know, a couple months ago now, I guess. This is not the best knife for this. It smells really, really good. I just cured it with some maple syrup salt, pepper, 
a little bit of brown sugar. And as you can see, it is a little bit gray and that's because I did not use pink curing salt, which is what actually makes your bacon pink. If you don't use the pink curing salt, then your bacon will be more of a natural pork color like this. So we're gonna do lots and lots of bacon because that's the best part of this salad. One of my big boys has offered to do the cutting of the bacon over there. So I am going to jar up our, oh shoot, <laughs> I forgot the carrots, one second. So we're just gonna grate these up and make a huge mess because it seems to be that kind of day. Some garlic, so we'll add that into here and get that mixed in. So now we're gonna add all of this into our jar. I'm gonna go grab a funnel. So pack your sauerkraut right down into your jar. This is well kneaded enough. You shouldn't need to add extra brine. You can top it off with a little extra brine if you need to, but you should have enough just from the liquid from the cabbage itself. I am going to add a horseradish leaf to the top of this to kind of hold everything down and then a few glass weights. Uh, the horseradish leaf has tannins in it, which can help with making um, any type of pickled thing you're making or fermented thing you're making a little bit crispier. And I'll be perfectly honest, I don't know if it actually works, but I always do it anyway. And since I have horseradish growing outside, I figure why not? I think I calculated the amount of cabbage I needed for this perfectly. And we have exactly the right amount for these two gallons. So this was around, I think, what was it? Two and a half heads. And the other um, kind of benefit of doing this is that it helps to keep all of your sauerkraut down below the water. And that's really important because anything that is above and exposed to the air will start to mold. So you wanna keep everything down below. So I use these little pickle pipes and little pickle pucks here. And this helps to hold everything down below the water or the liquid there. And then this has a little tiny hole in it and it helps for gas to escape. These ones come in the wide mouth and in the regular size. I would recommend if you are going to buy um, these that you get the wide mouth ones because it's a lot easier to get everything into your jar when you're doing ferments with a wider mouth opening. So there we go, we have our leaf in there. We're gonna stick our pickle puck on top. And I might have overfilled my jar just a little bit because this is going to bubble and this is probably going to overflow the side. But one thing that I always do when I'm doing ferments is put them on some kind of tray, usually a cookie tray with a bit of a lip on it, because even if I went to drain this down, it's likely gonna boil up, or not boil up, but bubble up over the side and then make a mess and it will wreck your counter. So make sure that you do put something there to protect. So we're going to put our leaf in there again. Here, I'll bring you up here so that you can see better. So there we go. Stick our puck in to hold everything down. And then we're going to put our pickle pipe on the top and put a lid. So if you don't have these pickle pipes, you can use just a piece of cloth with a, um, an elastic band to hold it down. I did that for years before I got these. You can put these anywhere that's, that's kind of a dark spot is a good idea. I have done this on my kitchen counter with just the natural daylight in the room and it hasn't caused any issues. Um, I like a seven to 10 day ferment. So after around seven days, you can start tasting it. And once it gets to the sourness that you personally like, then you can take it and pop it in your fridge and it will last in there for months and months and months. I've had it last up to six months without any issue. Okay, our bacon is just about fried up so we can start putting our salad together. I am pretty excited about these red wing onions because they're nowhere near at maturity yet, but they're still a decent size. And 
they, um, and I grew these ones from seed, which feels pretty great. Oh my goodness, I need my goggles. Oh, okay, these things save me. I don't remember who sent these to me, but if you are watching, thank you so much. I love them. I use swim goggles sometimes too. Rachel from that 1870s homestead sent me a couple of really groovy pairs of them. But these ones were actually designed for um, onions. I don't know if you can still buy them, but they're fantastic. Even though my eyes are protected right now, these are so hot that it's making my throat and my nose burn. This bacon is so delicious. So we're gonna throw our bacon into our salad over here and our onion. I can't wait to eat this salad. It's gonna be so tasty. So there we go. And you're supposed to add cheddar cheese to this as well, which I currently do not have. So we're not gonna be adding the cheese. We need three cups of mayonnaise. And whenever I show that I do not make my own mayonnaise, people always seem quite surprised by that because mayonnaise is one of those things that is very easy to make. I have done it before. It's just one of those things that I choose not, not to worry about. So we're gonna add our, was it white wine or red wine vinegar? Red wine vinegar, two thirds a cup. And I definitely grossly overestimated my uh, bowl size here. So we're just gonna dump this right in here. So we're gonna add two thirds a cup of red wine vinegar. Going to add some black pepper. I need some lemon juice. Okay, so we're gonna add our lemon juice, just a little bit, a bit of salt, and then a quarter cup of white sugar. And there it is, and it's delicious. It's definitely much better with cheddar cheese, but it's still delicious just like this. We are going to pause for a lunch break now, but before we close off today's video, we're going to head out to the cow pen and track down Thistle and see if she has had her calf yet. She has still not calved as of this morning, so I have no idea when this cow's gonna calf, but we'll go check it out. <laughs> oh no, she's definitely going to calf. <laughs> Just a matter of when at this point. Oh my gosh. I don't know if you can see, but if you look where her tail head is, I can show you better on Miss Honey over here. So this right here, do you see how it goes across and it's not sunken in? This, these are ligaments right here that completely soften out to just about nothing when a cow is going to calve. Check this out, is thistles. So you see how this is all, whoa, she just whacked me with her tail. She is so sassy. But see how it's all sunk down there? It's not completely gone, but very close. So major difference between her and her over here. Good grief, that cannot be comfortable. A lot of that swelling is called edema and it doesn't necessarily mean her udder is filled with milk because the tissue itself really swells up as well, just like it does with humans. Does anybody have any bets they wanna throw down around when this cow, where did she go? Where did she go? There she is, that cow is going to calf. So I'm filming this on the 31st of July. So if you have any guesses on to when she's actually going to calf, put those down in the comment section. I'm sure by the time I film my next video, she is going to have calved. So I'll be able to let you know when she's actually going to. I honestly thought she was gonna go to the day before yesterday and she never did. All right, that is it for today's video. I hope that you enjoyed it and I look forward to seeing you next time. Bye.